a lot of very smart folks here today. And we're going to be talking about two very important topics, the circular economy, and within that, where things stand with recycling, both the challenges the industry is dealing with, and also what needs to happen or change so that we ensure the long-term sustainability of recycling, something I think we all agree we want to and need to do. And what's not always obvious through all the discourse, debate, and at times disagreement about the status of recycling is that at waste management, we have high hopes for the future of recycling and the ability of many diverse stakeholders to come together and work constructively to solve these problems. So here at Waste Management's Sustainability Forum, we're going to talk about a lot of big things. But first, I want to talk about a very little thing, chickens. And that's because some folks have been calling us chicken little for using the word crisis to describe where we think we are in the current state of recycling. Some critics have said, this is not a crisis. They say this is, this is just a blip in the regular ups and downs of a commodity-based business. Some even suggest that because waste management owns landfills, we want recycling to fail. Well, to all of that, I cry foul, pun intended, by the way, because I think this is a crisis. And as the largest recycler, we certainly have an interest in solving this crisis. Someone recently asked us whether the largest landfill company could truly solve the recycling issues facing the industry today. I said, you're right. We own a lot of landfills. If there were a real problem in the landfill industry, wouldn't you want to call on us to see what could be done to fix it? And he said, of course. As the largest landfill owner, you know more about the industry than anyone. So my next question was, so if there was a real problem in the recycling industry, wouldn't you want to call in the largest recycler to see what they thought could be done to fix it? Again, he said, yes, of course. Well, and as Adele would say, hello, <laughs> can you hear me? Now, I got to tell you, first of all, David Steiner would never, there's no chance he'd stand up here and sing a couple of bars from an Adele song. So you, so you got something from me that you didn't get from him. <laughs> and it's not, an, it's not an easy song to sing, so uh, give me Brooks and Dunn or something. Um, because you see, we're, we're the largest recycler in North America and the largest residential recycler in the world. We've invested more than a billion dollars in recycling and we want to see our investment grow. We have by far the most invested in recycling assets in the US. So this notion that we don't care about recycling because we own landfills, well, pardon my language, it's just plain chicken dung. That's the last chicken thing I'm gonna say. So um, We don't wanna be the largest recycler in a shrinking pie. We want that pie to grow, and that's not where we are today. We want to do more recycling, not less, and that's also not where we are today. Since there's, a little that we can, since there's little that we can do to affect global market conditions, we're doubling down on those areas we can control. We're tightening our belt on investments and operational efficiencies. We're working to reduce the amount of expensive contamination at our MRFs. We're tackling the slow, difficult, but necessary process of changing the terms of our business agreement to ensure that recycling can be profitable and vibrant for the long term. So let me be clear, we want to see recycling thrive. It's the right thing for our environment. It's the right thing for our customers. We just want to make sure it's the right thing for our shareholders as well. And we're working proactively to do all of this. And make absolutely no mistake about it, when we fix recycling for waste management, we fix it for the entire industry. Another criticism of our crisis stance is the statement by some that this is just a blip in a historically cyclical business. 
Look, there have been plenty of blips in this industry, but this is not a blip. A blip lasts a month, six months, maybe a year, even two. But we're in our fourth year of low commodity prices. Prices have seen the lowest levels since the 2009 recession. But there are concerning factors that suggest this may be the new norm. Consolidation of paper mills has limited the number of domestic buyers. Then you have China's slow growth, and they've built a network to capture more internal volumes, thereby reducing their worldwide demand. Low energy prices also affect recycling and show no signs of changing. Recycling prices have, for decades, mirrored the price of oil, which means we don't expect a recovery anytime soon. And the strong U.S. dollar makes our commodities more expensive on the global market. Now, there was a time when none of this mattered because everything went to a landfill. Today, however, we care a lot about all these issues since they directly affect our business, our customers, and the future of recycling. If you care about the long-term sustainability of recycling, both environmental and economic sustainability, you have to do everything you can to fix some of the issues facing the industry. We cannot invest in recycling based on a hope that market conditions will improve. And we're not seeing much on the horizon that shows they'll improve anytime soon. And I have to say, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Peter Zine, forecaster and economist, regarding what he sees related to commodity markets. Ask the thousands of people who have lost their jobs or the recyclers who have gone bankrupt if this is a blip. They would tell you this is no blip. This is our new normal for the industry, for a good while anyway, and we have to adapt. So we've been criticized by some for calling this a crisis. And we've been called Chicken Little because some say we're saying the sky is falling. Well, guess what? They're right, in one respect at least. The sky isn't falling, but our investment in recycling assets sure is. At the peak, we invested $300 to $400 million per year in recycling assets. Today, we invest virtually nothing. And we aren't the only ones. Investment is down significantly industry-wide. If new investments are few and far between, and prolonged stagnant recycling rates are not what they call a crisis, then what is? This is a sustained low-price environment, and we don't see commodity prices improving anytime soon. We're fighting for the environment by sounding the alarm and working with municipal customers and others so we can find ways to adapt to these market conditions to ensure a vibrant future for recycling. We're not sitting back and waiting to see who's right and who's wrong. So what needs to change? When we started implementing recycling programs over two decades ago, we had a basic understanding that recycling is good for the environment because it reduces the use of virgin resources and conserves landfill space. We believed that efforts to recycle every last drop of materials would result in the greatest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. After all, if recycling reduces energy associated with the mining of virgin materials, then recycling more must be better, right? With that in mind, our customers developed aggressive recycling goals, zero waste, diversion, and zero waste landfill goals. 50%, 75%, even 90% diversion goals. And in response, we invested heavily in recycling programs and infrastructure, and organics management solutions too, because organics make up 30%, 30% of the waste stream. If we could recycle paper, plastics, metal, glass, and organics, we could get recycling rates over 70%.
To help our customers achieve these high recycling goals, we made recycling easier for customers by providing single stream recycling. All of the materials, paper, plastic, bottles, cans, went into one bin, and we invested in technology to separate the materials at our single stream recycling plants. And everyone was happy. Recycling rates went up. In fact, they more than doubled in some communities where we offered single stream recycling. Our customers loved the convenience and realized that single stream recycling played an important role in achieving high recycling rates. And the buyers of recycled materials were happy because they got recyclable, virgin, recyclable material that was cheaper than virgin materials. So they could help the environment while helping their bottom line. And we were happy because high commodity prices led to good profits from our recycling line of business. So we did what any company would do under such a rosy scenario. We invested more in single stream recycling assets. And we went even further. We wondered, could we use technology to get 100% diversion? And we believed we could. We invested in technologies to turn waste into electricity, fuel, and specialty chemicals. And the good news is, it worked. We had technologies, and we still have technologies, that work from a technological standpoint. But they're not the most economical. But we marched on because, like virtually all companies in 2007 and 2008, we believed in two things. First, that oil and energy prices would continue to go up and up. Remember the predictions of $200 oil? But we didn't need $200 oil for our innovations to be economical. We only needed $130 to $150 oil. And in 2007, that seemed like a given. So we invested in alternative green technologies. And remember the BRIC countries? They were going to eat up every virgin resource in the world because they were growing so fast and there was no end in sight to their double-digit growth. So they needed to augment virgin materials with recycled materials. And consequently, recycled commodity prices would go up and up forever. Under that rosy scenario, what would a prudent business person do? Well, we'd invest. And we did just that. We invested over $1.5 billion in new assets and technologies. And we, be we began to see signs of success until, and you know the end of this story, the fracking revolution drove oil prices down to 60, 50, 40, 30, maybe even lower. And those brick countries, well, they lived up to their name. They fell like a brick. And our investment in new technologies to create energy from waste all of a sudden weren't financially feasible. What do you do when assets don't make money? Well, you certainly don't direct your investment to those assets. As a for-profit company, we cannot invest in assets that lose money and create wild volatility. You had better adapt to the new reality. So let's tie this back to recycling. A recycle plant is like any other plant that makes a product. You have a cost to produce the product, then you have the price at which you can sell the finished product. So for a car manufacturer, if it costs, I don't know, $20,000 to produce a car, and they can sell the car for $25,000, they make a profit. That same formula usually made money in recycling. We spend money to process the materials we collect, separating the paper from the glass, from the metals and the plastics. We bundle the material and sell the finished product. So what happens when production costs are higher than sales? Well, that's certainly not a great formula for success. Businesses struggled to survive. Small recyclers began to go out of business. And large recyclers, like waste management, closed down unprofitable plants and slowed or ceased investing in new plants. 
So recyclers have really been hit by a double whammy. Commodity prices are down, and the quality of recyclables coming in the door has deteriorated as well. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Under the edge of no good deed goes unpunished, because we made it easier to recycle, consumers recycled more. And they figured they would put even more into the bin when in doubt, recycle, right? And that led to people putting things that weren't recyclable into their bin. So we have more contamination than we used to, which is stressing our systems and increasing processing costs. Sometimes, consumers just hope something can be recycled. If Christmas lights are made of metal, glass, and plastic, can't the recycler figure out how to pull them apart? Well, not with equipment designed to sort a plastic jug from an aluminum can. Recycling simply has become more confusing to customers. With the best intentions, they put a lot more non-recycled materials into their carts. And if you haven't had a chance to visit one of our single stream recycling plants, you should come out and take a tour. And I think you'll be amazed at, what, at the fact that we get 80% clean commodity out of the back of those plants when you see what comes up that initial feed line. We get everything under the sun. We get bowling balls, we get toilets, we get engine blocks. We get the deer hunter who thinks that the, somehow thinks the deer carcass goes in the recycle bin with the milk jug. No. All this drives our processing costs way up. Remember those Christmas lights? They wrap around our machinery and bring operations to a standstill. In some cities, we get up to 30 to 40 percent garbage in our recycle bins. 30 to 40 percent. And processing costs go up accordingly. There are some other societal changes that are threatening the economic sustainability of the current recycling model. We'd better understand them and adapt, rather than hope they just go away. Let's look first into our own homes and our grocery stores. Today, recyclables are mostly packaging. In fact, roughly 25% of the material that we generate in our daily lives is packaging. And most of the material in curbside recycling programs is either paper or packaging. Now think about your groceries. We used to buy soda in glass. This moved to aluminum cans in the 1970s and plastics in the 80s and 90s. Milk switched to plastic in the 1980s. And now we're seeing a shift to flexible packaging pouches. Flexible packaging and pouches are used for just about everything. They're great for the brand and great for consumers. They protect food, are convenient, and can be designed for just about any product. They've replaced glass jars in the baby food aisle and paper boxes in the frozen food aisle. They're used for tuna fish, almonds, coffee, soup, detergent, and yes, even chicken. Lightweight, energy efficient, and convenient. When you look at flexible packaging from a life cycle standpoint, it's a winner in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Flexible packaging is just about perfect, except it cannot be recycled. It's growing quickly since it works so well with our changing on-the-go lifestyles and changing demographics. The plastic used for single-serve, on-the-go products tends to be either non-recyclable because of the type of packaging material used, or unrecyclable because their shape and size are not compatible with recycling processing equipment. And this new packaging is replacing material that was recycled. Flexible packaging is a great example of the need for the recycled industry to adapt to the changes around us. These changes are real and are here to stay. Adapting, evolving, whatever you want to call it, recycling needs to change to reflect the changes happening around us. We're starting to come full circle in my remarks. When demand for commodities began to fall about three years ago, we saw a steady decline in commodity prices. 
such that in some quarters, we lost money in recycling. And in quarters when we made money, very little. Certainly not enough to cover our cost of capital. And what does a for-profit business do when it can't cover its cost of capital? It invests its capital elsewhere. So you might be asking yourself, as we are, what about those high diversion rates we're all after? Well, particularly for many of our municipal customers, they're going to be very hard to achieve. Just consider the changes in packaging I mentioned. They reduce waste and provide important environmental benefits. But they make it difficult, if not impossible, to achieve lofty weight-based recycling goals. So what can we do to move the diversion rates in the right direction? Well, it all starts by asking a key question. What is the goal? Is it to recycle everything we can? Or is it to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and virgin material use? Both goals require a great deal of collaboration and effort and a different way of thinking. If the goal is to recycle everything, we have a lot of work to do. If that's what our customers want, we can certainly do it. But there's a cost to achieving this goal, and business as usual is simply not an option. What if, rather than the goal of being recycle everything, it was instead to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and virgin material use? Shouldn't we be using lifestyle thinking Life cycle thinking to develop the programs with the best environmental impact? Should we be thinking more about the parts of recycling that achieve the greatest greenhouse gas emissions reductions and what could be done to maximize those aspects of recycling? And at what cost? When we view the world through this lens, we become focused on recycling the right things as well as we can. Much has been said and written about recycling recently. We've got two of the brightest minds on the topic here with us to share their views today. John Tierney wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times that drew a whole lot of attention, and still is. And we also have Bloomberg contributor and author Adam Minter with us. He's written a lot on recycling over the years, and also wrote a piece in response to John's, where he outlined his view on the state of recycling. And by the way, he flew from Malaysia to get here today. Their perspectives are different, creating the opportunity for a really great discussion ahead with Dana Perino. As I read their writing and all the pieces on the state of recycling, it was evident that there were various sets of facts and assumptions out there. And we felt strongly that if we're going to truly fight for the environment and ensure that recycling was both environmentally and economically sustainable for the long term, it would be important to somehow arrive at a common set of facts around what is really good for the environment and at what cost. If we could get there, might we be able to find some common ground so that we could all work together to find solutions for these important issues? And if we did that, maybe we then find a way to make recycling both environmentally and economically sustainable. We've long thought it would, be a, it would be great to get an honest broker of sorts to do this. And maybe that person or group is out there. But we thought we'd add to the discussion today just to see what answers we could get to one simple question. Along the spectrum of diversion options available today, which is most environmentally profitable? We looked at many, many scenarios, ranging from throw everything into the landfill to process the last drop for value. Now, we don't know that we've gotten this completely right, but we feel it's mostly right, and we're going to continue to test this with many stakeholders. But at first blush, here's what we found. First, recycling significantly reduces greenhouse gases. And second, increasing environmental performance comes with increasing costs. Recycling
recycling makes up the bulk of potential greenhouse reductions associated with end-of-life materials management solutions. Emissions associated with collection and transportation are negligible compared to the benefits of recycling to reduce the use of raw materials. Paper recycling drives the greatest greenhouse gas reduction based on both volume and greenhouse gas per ton. Metals recycling contribute the next greatest greenhouse gas benefit. HDPE and PET plastics are also meaningful contributors. When it comes to organics, yard waste recycling adds relatively small greenhouse gas benefits because organics recycling does not benefit from a reduction in raw materials use, as do other recyclables. Food waste recycling adds greenhouse gas benefits, but the high cost of managing food waste may contribute to the spotty regional nature of organics program development. Glass. Of all the commodities, glass has very little materials conservation value, since the virgin components of glass are sand and soda ash, which are readily available. Now, to some municipalities, recycling glass matters, and we understand that, and we'll recycle it. There's just a cost that needs to be recognized. The bottom line, recycle paper, metal, plastics all day long. We can recycle as much of that material as possible and can obtain the greatest environmental benefit at the least cost to society, consumers, and customers. And if you want to recycle other materials, glass, organics, and other materials, we'll do it, but you should know the cost-benefit analysis of doing so. In closing, what does this all mean? At Waste Management, we're improving our operational efficiencies and are working with our customers to adjust contract language to reflect current recycling realities. We've also ramped up our education efforts regarding what's recyclable and what's not. We're doing everything we can do to get the economic model right for recycling, for our customers and for us, so it's sustainable for the long haul, so we can continue to invest in recycling infrastructure and the right infrastructure, given the changing environment we're operating in today. We must improve the quality of recyclables collected and focus on recycling the right materials. And that's about us and our customers working together to do a better job educating consumers on how to recycle right. New collection and business models need to be developed for materials like glass that today have little resale value and challenge the capacity of our current recycling infrastructure. We need to set realistic goals. And let me, let me say that again. We need to set realistic goals. By simply trying to recycle everything in order to achieve higher recycling goals, we end up with higher costs without correspondingly higher environmental benefits. We must work with our partners along the entire value chain, from product manufacturers to end users, we must all be thinking as part of a single interrelated system to ensure that environmental models are right. The role of recycling in the broader context of the circular economy, where everything has value, is one that's gaining traction and requires a different way of approaching our business. To do this, we need to move forward towards a life cycle thinking approach, where we evaluate each material to determine its optimal flow and value throughout its life, not just how it's managed at the end of its life. I happen to think this is a time full of opportunity for recycling. Seizing that opportunity is going to take the collective efforts of all stakeholders in the chain working together to do some things different so we can all, together, create successful and sustainable recycling models for the future. And at Waste Management, we will persevere, but we ask others to not wait until there's a crisis. 
Instead, let's start focusing on what we should be doing together to improve recycling. I believe that if we can come together and work constructively to solve these problems, recycling will grow and thrive and we can all reap the environmental and economic rewards. Thank you very much.